Um, hello everyone. Uh, let's pray everything works, because I'm somewhere new, or somewhere old, depending on your perspective. Uh, welcome to everyone who's here. There's 11 of you so far. Um, yeah. Good, good morning, or actually good afternoon. Not sure which. Hello, Marcel. Uh, yeah, so... I I saw some people in Discord, like uh, GoDave, talking about how they thought this lecture topic would be useful. And uh, there's a specific reason um, I, I want to talk about, not just trade-offs in general, which I do want to talk about, uh, because people, I think, uh, one of the biggest problems in Go is that there's a tendency to fixate on specific things. So you focus on, you don't focus on the whole picture, you focus on what catches your attention. And that, that messes up, you know, everyone's judgment all the time. So trade-offs are a bit big topic in Go, but that it's too big of a topic. So I decided to go for invasions. I want to talk a little bit about what can go wrong when you invade stuff. And uh, why you were probably a little bit over-eager to do so, I suppose. So this is, um, um, this is the direction we're going to be going in today. And... Uh, as usual, one of my students triggered me to do this lecture. Uh, I, I had other triggers also. It's a long-standing trigger um, that's been... It's, it's been in the pressing for a while, I suppose. Uh, well, pull. You pull a trigger, I suppose. Yeah. So, I had a lesson with a student of mine recently. And uh, he sent me some games. Uh, that he played, you know, on, on some server. Uh, oh, pick up some milk. Hello, more people. Um, so he sent me some games that um, he played, and I looked through them, and I was like, okay, I can, I can make a lesson topic out of this. There's some really interesting stuff here. Uh, and it had a lot to do with, uh, you know, what I considered overvaluing territory, not really, um, not really visualizing what influence can do. That's, that's what I thought was his, um, his biggest issue. So I prepared a lesson around that. Oh, ben, Baby Shamble also here. Welcome, everyone. Um, so I, I prepared a lesson, and I, I, I want to first quickly show the game that we're going to talk about to start off the lecture, the game my student played, and he's black. And, uh, you know, the, the beginning of, of the game is relatively normal. We're not going to talk about it too much. My student's a very territorial player, uh, very good at endgame for his level, which is about EGF, I'm going to say 2Q. Um, Hard to say since no tournaments get played. And I want to get to a specific point in the game. Yeah, which is the C9 move. So right now, from my perspective, these two groups, it's not like they're weak, but one of the things you could consider is connecting them. Because uh, then they're even stronger, then they're like one unit. And the other moves I'm considering are like maybe making a corner enclosure, etc. My student chose to play C9, and then uh, it, it got kind of more interesting because he just took all the money, sort of, and this is the sequence we ended up with. And I thought that this was a very interesting way of playing. It's not strictly speaking an invasion, but I do wanna I do wanna use it as a way to kickstart the discussion around invasions and their trade-offs, because in a way it does this looks like an invasion almost. This this really looks like Black invaded White's area and got enclosed but lived. And uh, function functionally, it, it basically acts like an invasion, which is why I thought it's interesting. Uh, hello, Siku. Uh, and I want to develop a bit why this is not necessarily good for Black. Uh, however, I want to start by saying why I think it appealed to my students. Um, and this is back to a topic that we've talked about many times in Go, which is tangibility, right? So... Uh, you guys all like points, or like almost all of you like points. And those of you who don't like points like influence because you think you can make more points that way. Um, and that's not bad, right? Uh, that's that's what that's what we play Go for, right? We play Go in order to make um, make influence uh, influence. That's Freudian slip because I I play I I play the way I play, but you know that um, we you know we are meant to win by making more points, and it's, I think a lot of players would really, really, really much rather have black here, right, than white. Uh, and, you know, um, 
I mean, I agree with them, but I agree with them because A, A was slow. It's not my fault that White didn't Tanuki here. Um, but, you know, the, the point is that people like having this very secure territory, uh, and that's why certain people like my student are willing to take uh, whoop, whoops! Are, are willing to take uh, Gote with such a sequence to solidify their corner territory, and uh, there's nothing wrong with wanting points. That that is how you win the game. But there's something wrong with wanting points too much. So that's that's a little bit, you know. I I think a lot of you might know um, a relatively well known maxim of Jeff's, which is that points are poison and. This, this happens to a lot of people. So for example, here, I think that what appealed to someone like my student about B11 is that it's taking white's territory. Like these stones of white, as soon as, as black plays B11, um, there's not an obvious purpose for these stones because black's just taking the money. And that's, that's a very powerful thing for a lot of people. Um, I like the super strong white. White couldn't expect so many points on the left side. Anyway, black has no growth on the left side. I completely agree with you. That's why in this position, I really like white, you know? And that's why I thought that this is a good game, you know, out of the game my student sent me, I thought this was a good one to look at with him because um, I think that he seriously misjudged. The left side, one of the very important things to recognize is that the left side isn't that big in the first place. So this whole idea of putting a stone down here, I, I really wouldn't endorse it, you know? I'd actually much rather connect my stones in the center I'd also much rather make a Shimari enclosure. Uh, so I, I agree with Marcel here. Uh, hello there, uh, Godev89 joins the party um, also. So my point is that this is not objectively what I'd call a good idea. I have a hard time preferring either color. That's interesting um, that you wouldn't prefer either color. I think. I think here I would definitely prefer white, and the reason is that white's all connected and strong, and both A and B are going to suffer now because of black's choices. Um, and that this appeals to my student, I think, is kind of like, oh, I take my opponent's points with C, isn't that nice? And then, like, it's to an extended disregard, like, for the rest of the board, I suppose. Um, only to an extent. And then, okay, let's see how the game continues, because I thought that the game showcased really aptly how black is meant to suffer in these positions. So actually white played relatively well. So this is, I think they played on KGS and it's like one down level. And yeah, I, like for example here, um, white basically let black connect on the first line and got a really strong shape in return. And actually the way the end game's gonna look uh, potentially in the future is like uh, uh, probably like this, which is it's just great for white. So you know, black is already like connecting on the on the first line. Eventually, uh, oh wait, this is, uh, eventually black is is going to have to like turtle and live really like meekly with his group in the center. Also. So I looked at this position, I was pretty sure I liked white, because black technically has a lead on points, but I mean, this whole, this whole like mammoth structure of white has a lot of value. And this is what I wanted to talk about with my students. So I start my lesson and, and you know, we're talking and I'm like, um, yeah, lead on poison. Yeah, exactly. Very, very good description. Black has the lead on points. Actually, I love that so much I might start using it. Like when you're ahead on points, but you're actually behind that the lead on poison. I, I really love that. I really love that. Also, a lot of my students, uh, well, my students and also my opponents poison themselves all the time. So, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I, I love the description. So, okay. We come to my lesson with my student, you know, um, and he was like, oh, out of these games, I didn't think any of them was that interesting. The most interesting was this one, he said, and, and his reasoning was like, for why it wasn't that interesting was, well, I was ahead by 20 points and then I gave away my points on the right side. 
That was his argument. You know, and I heard that and I was like, wow. Like, I, I was impressed at the description because I wasn't sure we were talking about the same game. Uh, and his argument, his argument was that from this moment to, wait, I have it in my notes where we have to skip. Um, let's see. Wait, I, I thought I had it in my notes. Okay, well, let's go. Let's go. I think it was like move 122 that I wanted to compare with. Yeah, yeah. Okay, my memory's good. Um, so he was like, well, how did this happen? Like, I got scammed, you know? Like, how did, how did White live in my corner and take the right side? And like, how did he get everything? That was, that was what he was complaining about. Um, but at the same time, he couldn't really point out a mistake he made. So he was like, I don't know what I did wrong. So this was, um, this was a very interesting experience for me as a teacher. Um, to be fair, this, that, that, this cap probably gave away 20 points. Uh, this cap, this cap. Not sure about which cap, but yeah, some cap. Um, so, okay. We, we got to this position of oh, the start of the sequence. Still not sure which, but it will. Live in my corner, but the left side was his as well. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about that. So the way our conversation started, and this is where we're going to talk a little bit about trade-offs in general and not just trade-offs regarding influence. His suggestion was, what if I play here? And his logic was, well, in the game, he lived with like 20 points on my right side. So what if I play this way now and I don't let him get into the right side? And I was like, well, okay, let's look at this. And, he, you know, we played out this sequence. I'm playing white. He's playing black. Um, and then I played here. And then he played here. And then we got to this position. And I was like, okay, let's compare these two, these two situations, right? Uh, and uh, we counted points, like uh, we, we did a bunch of like approximation and, you know, we, we counted points comparing like the two situations. And uh, the long and the short of it is we concluded that Black's not worse in, in, in the situation he wanted. Um, and the, the point I made to him was, you're focusing on what you lost and not on what you gained. Like this is... Uh, like, for example, when you Hane and white cuts and white goes down, you get spectacularly strong. You get all of these, you get all this shape, you get all these points on the top right, and you get Sente, right? And in the game, Black actually played a G11, and G11 was actually a safe move because he perceived himself as a head, um, like just in case he would die with his center group. So Black basically passed one move and still got an equal result to his alternative, right? And this is why, to me, considering what I would call costs and benefits carefully are, is really, really, really important. So you can't just play here, then look at the costs, and then, and then say, well, I should have played here. Because this move also has costs. The 11 also has costs. And I think that it's this relatively imbalanced view of cost and benefit that sort of um, often causes people like my student, and I think his mindset is relatively common, to be overly territorial. And, and this is where we go back to this move, right? Like this C9, B11 idea, in my opinion, is crazy. Like, you, you, I mean, it's not really crazy, it's just inexperience, right? Like, if, if someone my level did this, I'd call them crazy. Um, but, you know, maybe at the, at the 2Q, 1Q level, well, he goes for what's tangible. He goes what he what he can see, you know. Um, so Black sees this point and he takes them, you know. And um, that that's I think a very common um, mindset. I can understand Black's thinking. You can clearly see the right side points, but not the center potential. Hence the sense of loss. Yeah. So th this is exactly um, this is exactly the question I asked my student. I said, in this position. What do you expect out of the right side of the board? Like, if we include this influence versus Black's territory on the right, how much of a territorial lead do you expect to have on this half of the board by the end of the game? You know? 
Um, so I tried to put the question in terms of, well, realistically, by the end of the game, what do you think will happen? Because what he did was he looked at his corners and he was like, oh, I'm 20 points ahead, you know, because I have 20 more points, you know. Uh, but then we talked about it and we figured that probably White's influence is at least worth 20 points. So uh, the argument I made was, well, this center potential of White's, it is a, you know, token of trade that will, you know, cannon will be used to reduce Black's uh, influence. I mean, it... Even if white doesn't reduce the right side, white will build in the center in exchange. Go, go. One of the things about go is that it's always more nuanced than people think. Like whenever you think you're only getting something, right? Um, like when you only think you're getting something, you're usually not only getting something. I'm surprised he thought that way. Aren't the holes in blacks uh, right obvious with such influence? Well, yeah, they are. I mean, he didn't expect to keep everything, but I think what he thought, the way that he was thinking was, I keep this line, I keep this line. Um, yeah, drink, take, <laughs> take a drink when Oscar says influence. Yeah, um, I, I mean, like, I mean, you, 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 you guys have seen me play. Um, yeah, so I think he thought I'm keeping these two lines of territory and that's enough and like the center isn't much because there's no points in the center that's his philosophy and i i understand it like you know if we're you know many people play go a little bit um empirically like by what they can observe and they observe points so i think it takes a lot of experience or or a teacher telling you um to understand that in this position on this half of the board it's arguable that white's not behind at all. Like, um, white, white will very easily make back all of the territorial deficit. Uh, and that's to be expected. So my student was like really mad um, that he, in his mind, got scammed. You know, like he looked at this result and he's like, I got scammed. And like, of course you got scammed. You played G11. <laughs> um, you, you passed once. Of course you got scammed. Uh, actually, White's um, White's oh, White's P eleven move, um, like White's plan here was not very good in my opinion, because of course I mean he was annoyed. He was already annoyed at this shape, because he was like, well, White broke into my my right side and now my corner is vulnerable. I don't like that, you know. And like, but you got you got this shape. You got the two stones, right? That's really nice. You solidified your corner and you have sent it. Um, so for me, there were a lot of benefits here for Black still. Um, incidentally, this makes it extremely easy for Black to always break into White's influence like like this. I mean, and by the way, the follow up is is like this now, and White has no points. So for me, for me, White's invasion was not even very good. Uh, but he felt like he got scammed. Now my corner is vulnerable to Nuki's. Yeah. So uh, yeah, his argument was that he felt like he's still ahead on points, uh, even if his corner gets invaded. And then he was like annoyed that white made so many points off of the corner and you know um and the argument i made was well it's a corner enclosure but look at what it's surrounded by right it's an enclosed corner enclosure so mentally it's not easy to play a move like black r5 yeah yeah r5 r5 is probably what i would play so yeah a way to play i mean Actually, no, uh, I suggested O3 to my, stu to my students, so o O3 would be a move I'd consider. And yeah, um, I thought that this, um, this you know, game was a good starting point to discuss a little bit the nature of what appeals to us when we think, because I think my students' mindset is, you know, relatively representative of how we think in the game. Yeah, this topic reminds me a lot of emotional attachments. Yeah, 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 exactly. So... Um, I've talked about this before. There are certain things that appeal to us that shouldn't appeal to us. And one of the things that appeal to us is things we can see, right? Like we value points more than influence, usually. Like the reason I value influence is because I've played more games than most of this chat combined. So I have a lot of, it, a lot of experience, you know? I'm like, oh, I, I know that this should work out for me, you know? 
And what happens to a lot of my students is, is that I talk to them and we discuss, you know, I start making examples about how white's influence will be useful, right? Even if it doesn't, strictly speaking, make points, even if it doesn't clearly um, enclose any territory, right? I start making examples of how it might be useful if we fight here, you know, if white ever invades the right side. Like, there's all of these um, hidden benefits. Um, oh, we have a raid from Tateson. Uh, Tateson, um, yeah, th thank you, Tateson. So um, uh, she was playing an NGD game. So, you know, NGD, we're, we are a ghost school. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I guess most people know here. Um, and she was playing a, a game for our, the NGD League, uh, which teachers like me review. So yeah, uh, how did it go? Who won? Um, in, any, in any case, we're talking a little bit about uh, trade-offs and, uh, and a little bit, um, let's say, what we don't look at uh, when, we, when we think about the game. Oh, Tate's in one. Nice. Uh, which means Garden didn't win, which is unfortunate for Garden. Uh, but you know, um, that's how goal works, I suppose. Well, uh, so back to the lecture topic. I think that, I, like, what I want to talk through is some examples of how influence in some of my games and some of my students' games that that I've seen, like from now on in the lecture how influence didn't enclose territory, but was still useful. Uh, and I think that that's a very important thing to consider. I mean, uh, in this particular case, for example, a very long time ago, Black sowed the seeds of his defeat by playing this um, relatively small, relatively slow, and very weakening invasion. And, you know, he didn't really see the effects. He thought he was ahead all game. And he didn't really see the effects of White's influence until, you know, many, many moves later. And I think at, you know, maybe at this point, when White lived on in the center and right side with like, you know, nearly 30 points, he had a feeling that he, like, he ascribed it to him playing badly, right? Uh, and it's actually not him playing badly. He didn't play the right side badly. He played the rest of the game badly. And, um... He basically thought he threw the game here, but he didn't know how. Uh, and I remember this used to happen to me a lot, you know? I would make points, I thought I could handle the influence, and then I thought I made a big mistake, you know? Um, and that's not really what happened. What happened is that when you play against influence, your opponent's bound to get a good result whether you mess up or not. Uh, if influence does make points directly, it's inefficient, right? Well, I wouldn't go as far as to say that. If you set out to make points with influence, then it's inefficient, yes. Like, if influence... Eventually, influence does make points. Eventually. But you can't make influence and then be like, let's protect my points. That's not how influence works. Um, influence, you, you, you have influence and you use it assertively. Uh, because if you use it to try and enclose points, then that's, that's not really efficient. Like, if you wanted to make points, you could go to the corners where it's easier to make points. In the center, centers are open everywhere, so influence is, is rarely uh, a good place uh, to make territory. Um, of course, if you use influence correctly, in the long run, it will make some points. Or you will make some points because of it, let's say. Um, oh, hello, Garden. Um, all demoted from the league. Happens when you lose, I suppose. Um, unfortunate. Um, yeah, so... Now we're going to talk about these examples, and we're going to talk a little bit through how even though the influence in these games, let's say, lost their points, right? Um, they are still useful. They still make profit. And I hope that walking through these examples will give a little bit of a perspective of how trade-offs work and go. Um, how generally we always lose less than we think we lost and we always gain less than we think we gained because we don't keep everything in mind so that's that's what we're going to do from now on um yeah mm -hmm. and actually I'm, I'm debating which example to start with i think i'll start with one of my own games i have a game from a student that i i wanted to show also but i might start with one of my own games um yeah, people like to collect coins in games, also like points and go. Yeah, pe people love points way too much. 
And uh, I have an opponent that really loves points that I regularly um, that I regularly play in European tournaments. Um, it you know I'm gonna count on that he's not here, and I'll say that I regularly beat in European tournaments. But you know he's not gonna hear that. Um, so hopefully, okay. So I I'm black, and I you know I I have a relatively thick style of play these days. So my, my style of play has transitioned a little bit. I wouldn't say that I play influence anymore so much as that I just make really thick shapes and I hope they work out, let's say. Uh, and I think that's exemplified in this particular game. I've shown this game in a lecture before, but uh, actually in my previous lecture, it was on my lecture on sacrificing stones. And um, in that game, and my opponent's like a strong five done, I suppose, in uh, EGF five done. And this was played in a tournament like earlier this year. Yeah. And uh, what I talked about in that lecture of mine was sacrificing stones and how this sacrifice is fine for black. So that was that, that, that was the discussion last time. Uh, but that's not really the point of today's lecture. The point of today's lecture is that we're going to talk about we're going to talk about, yeah, this influence. Um, and I have a couple of questions for the audience now, also because I, I want to drink some water. So um, the first question that I would ask in this position is, what's your impression as to who's better? Who would you prefer? Uh, and, uh, you know, you can count points, you can look at the influence, or you, I mean, you can just say your impression, I suppose, by looking at the board, that's fine also. Uh, and the second question, which I would like you to answer, uh, or at least think about, is what about this invasion? Like, can white invade? Uh, because that's probably rather important when you're considering who might be better. Like, do you consider the lower side black's solid territory or not? Um, it's less important than you think it is, but it's still important. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you think about that a bit. Hmm. So one of the things that I sort of liked about this game, so while, while people think about this, I, um, I have to say, even though the sacrifice of these stones was slightly dubious, it ended up working out for me and I, I really enjoyed it because I got a lot of profit. So, uh, for example, I got to play here, like I got to press white uh, and over concentrate him on the top left. And, and then I got to play, I got to play G14 for F15 exchange. Um, yeah, I got to play this exchange, which like when I played this exchange, I was like, I, I, I don't care if I win or not anymore. This is just too amazing. I'm too happy here. Look at this like jump shape. So I was very happy. Uh, but there's a difference between being happy and being good. Uh, I have a hard time preferring either color again. Seems like a game. White center stones look really thin. Both good observations. Um, yeah, if you put this into a computer, and, and I thought this during the game, even though I liked black, I preferred playing black. I had to recognize that the game is probably about even. So white has, let's see, six on the lower left. White has about 51 points in cash and then also Komi. So it's like 57-ish. And then black has like, I'm gonna say 15 on the top side. And then and then like, uh, you know, 15 more on the lower side. And for me, it's unclear whether the lower side is considered territory. So I'm obviously behind on territory, but then on the other hand, B and C are really thin. Black's obviously, Black obviously has more influence. It is white's turn. So, you know, I figured this is about playable for both. Uh, the corner looks big, white only had one stone there. Yeah, well, this was, White only had one stone, but then white added a lot of stones close to it. That that was my um that was my how I rationalized the sacrifice. So originally white only had one more stone, but eventually the end game looks like this for black. I'm gonna get so much profit, like in the end I'm going to squish the white territory um 
quite um, badly. I didn't think this was good for me. I, I just thought it's not bad. Uh, the middle shape will suffer. I'd probably prefer a white, probably maybe just reducing the bottom is enough and then get to the top right first. Okay, so we have um, we have Godave suggesting a game plan uh, and I'm going to um, take creative license and interpret his reduce the top, uh, well, reduce the bottom side as uh, L4, for example. And let's say, just for the sake of argument, that black just keeps the points, uh, which I think is fair. And then I think the problem with white's position, um, the drawback of white's position, is that white actually can't just get to the corner first. Like, okay, let's say, oh, uh, let's say that I don't start misclicking every move. Okay, let's say that we play some Joseki, then white stones in the, in the center are really thin. So from my perspective, white sort of owes a move to stabilize. And that means black's going to get the first move on the right side. Um, and I'm not saying this makes the position bad for white or something. I'm saying that, you know, that you have to keep it in mind. Um, yeah, I would also reduce this white. Uh, and, now, and now we get to the second question um, that I ask the audience, which is, can white invade? And uh, my opponent had a very clear opinion on this. Uh, he clearly thought he could invade. Um, and, and if he could, he did. And in my opinion, uh, I think there's this saying about, um, about science. Um, isn't there some quote about like, uh, that sci like scientists like uh, considering whether they can and never consider whether they should? Um, is Asu the opponent? How did you guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is exactly how Asu plays. Yeah. Uh, and Asu, Asu is a strong player. He's good at certain things, uh, but his judgment's very territory oriented, in my opinion. Um, yeah, yeah, so it, it is Asu. I mean, Asu's very good at certain types of games. He's a very strong fighter. I, I'd rather not get into a fighting game with him where the position's unclear. Um, Jurassic Park quote. I, I don't know where the quote's from. I've just heard it and, and I like it. Uh, it might be from Jurassic Park because I, I read the book like a million years ago. But um, his judgment is very terrible. No. <laughs> I wasn't going to say terrible, very territory oriented. Um, yeah. And uh, I think that Asu here had a very uh, specific intention. I invade, I'm winning on points. Right? Um, okay, so it is a Jurassic Park quote. Okay, that's nice to know. Uh, yeah. So uh, Asu went, uh, went uh, all... Uh, I don't know, created some dinosaurs here or something, metaphorically speaking, and uh, invaded. And my first thought when he invaded, it, it wasn't clear to me if the invasion is good for not. Um, yeah, okay, can you kill white with Kosumi? That's a good question. Can you kill white? But this wasn't the question I was interested in. The question that I was interested in is, am I going to get this move in Sente? Um, which is a pretty simple question, and it has an easy answer. The answer is yes. And um, what I figured was, I'll put as much pressure as I can, uh, and eventually I'll get profit. Uh, I might kill, but that's not my primary concern. So you could Kosumi, I think, most probably, I, I guess, there's a chance white might attach. There's a chance white might attach and try to go this way, and if you enclose, white goes this way and does something crazy like this and, and just tries to survive. Kosumi is a good move. Uh, I attached, and then white... Um, oh yeah, okay, so white's plan, I think, was this is this, and then probably he, he figured that this is sort of disgusting for white, and uh, he decided to get his group out. Like, getting enclosed isn't, like, fun. Even if white lives. Is this a living shape? I'm too lazy to, to read it. Um, I didn't even read whether this is a living shape because it's good for me either way. So. Ah. Uh, and the reason it's good for me is that there's a lot of trade offs to this invasion, right? And, and this is what we're going to talk about, right? This is, this is the main topic of the, of, the, of the lecture. Isn't attaching to a weak stone against fundamentals? Did you try and make him heavy? Um, I, I'm kind of trying to relegate him to the lower side. So what M4 is saying 
Uh, first of all, it's a move I've seen AI play in similar situations, and I've, you know, um, I've had similar positions where this move has been a good move, so it's become a sort of a shape instinct. And the other thing I'm trying to do is to press white as, a, like, I'm trying to be as oppressive as I can to white, because my argument is that the lower side is small. All I want here, all I want, I don't want anything more, I want sente, and I want p2. So this variation is already a success for black, whether white's alive or not. And I guess white is alive here. Um, I'll say that um, the correct shape here should be a turn for black, and then here, 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 here. And then, you know, this is already just a fantastically profitable move for black to, to play, um, because white's territory in the corner is, is uh, destroyed. And the other thing that happens is that black's is that Black's influence is even stronger than before. So some people were talking about how these two stones are really thin. I mean, Black's gonna cut here really soon. And then you have to deal with the two stones. So this is exactly the trade-offs we're talking about. White invaded because he could. It's not unclear if he could, right? Um, it's, it's not unclear, like, it's not clear if he can invade. But the point is that it isn't good anyway. And the lower side is not very big. That's the thing. So, and, and there's, way too, there's way too big of a price. When you're living in such a cramped area, you're definitely giving P2 or even, you know, God forbid, Q2. And that's really dangerous because very soon you'll find that the, the reason you invaded, which is points, you'll very, very quickly lose back the points. And this is, I think, something that happens to a lot of players, even some really strong players. Uh, they invade because it's appealing. And the reason it's appealing is that from white's perspective, the lower side is like my area, right? Um, that, yeah, what even was the point? There's no point exactly, no territory. So. It's like my area. So people like thinking in this way that, oh, something that's yours, I took it. That's good for me, right? Uh, and, and I know that because I think like that also sometimes, and then I lose. And it, then if I stop thinking like that, then sometimes I win. Um, so we're very tempted to, to go for that type of simplistic thinking, and it doesn't work in this position. Yeah, it's so hard to get away from that line of thinking. Yeah, so th this, is a re this relates very heavily to the subject of emotional attachments, right? Um, I did a lecture on this. When there's something that we perceive as ours or that we perceive as our right, it's really, really hard to get away from that. And that's why, um, you know, probably some weaker players than me would see this white move and panic because white's living, you know? Um, and I didn't panic. I was actually quite happy he invaded. Uh, I expected him to shoulder hit. Um, and when he invaded, I was like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm probably doing well. And okay, it wasn't 100% clear to me whether uh, my invasion, well, well, whether his invasion was going to be profitable for me, but one move later it was, because he made this exchange. So when he made this exchange, I was like, okay, okay, I won. Like, that was kind of, I mean, it's not that bad, but it's, it's getting close. Um, and this is one of the problems when you invade uh, and I, you know, I want to talk very briefly about one example uh, that I, I actually kind of prepared. Um, forget the move order. So if you see this type of position, it's technically possible, and we're going to see a position later in the lecture where this happens. It's technically possible for white, uh, for black to invade here. Like you can peep here, and you can peep here. And then you, you can probably get away with some type of invasion. Like, it's technically possible. Um, and let's see, here, 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 here. And then you play the, the absolutely gorgeous living move of this or something like that. It's possible, you know? Um, I'm not saying it's good, it's, it's just possible. Uh, and, uh, I mean, there's a lot of nuance to this because white, white has a lot of different ways to play against this. Yeah, typical titan sequence for black. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and what people, like, this type of invasion can be good, it's not always bad, uh, but it's not as good as people think. 
And the reason is, let's compare this, right? Let's imagine black plays here, and like in the end game, and then, you know, at some point or another, white might play here, or else black might get some follow-up. And then let's say black plays, uh, plays on this side also. The, the, you know, white's territory isn't that big. You know, this lecture is turning into Taijin 101 very quickly. Yeah, so what um, what Taijin players do, and also Fox players, is that they're like, oh, this is white's territory. You know? And then, then he's like, haha, this isn't white's territory. You know? Um, and then, and then maybe they would start reading, uh, and then realize that maybe they're not alive with this move, which they might not be. So then they'd make this exchange, and then they'd be like, haha, now I'm alive. Um, and then this would happen, and they, they've net lost points. So I'm, I'm exaggerating for effect, right? Yeah, well, and then white would be, yeah, yeah. and then in the typical Taijin game, right? Uh, where white's also a Taijin player, like the stereotypical Taijin player, white would be like, but I lost, I'm losing my points. So he would do this, get cut in fully split Kama and give black good shape. Um, and then black would be mad because white kept some of his points. So this is like, this is what I would call relatively primitive thinking that some really strong players partake of, you know? Um, yeah, so... The point is that when you're reducing something, you're kind of forced, like if black reduced this area, black is getting moves on the outside. And this is what I call the burden of territory. The burden of territory is a concept I really like because um, in this game, for example, so in this game, white, for example, decided that these stones were his territory. And, Throughout the game, he had to keep proving that. So F14 kept proving that, which is a move you wouldn't usually play. Then, you know, these moves kept proving that. And me getting me getting this exchange, AB, kept proving that. And eventually I'm going to get this endgame also. So the whole game, White has to keep justifying that he owns this territory. And that has a negative value. Conversely, if I had decided I want to live with the group and I run with a weak group, that has value for white. Now, the reason this is okay for white is that it's a lot of territory. So he's willing to suffer for this. And uh, that's fine, right? But there is a concept in Go which I call the burden of territory. When you say something's your territory, you have to keep paying for it. Uh, and that's why it's so hard to make points in the center because the burden of territory is really high. Uh, like there's... Like, it's open on all sides, so your opponent keeps, like, you know, reducing it. Um, that goes back to the issue that lots of people with high IQ make bad decisions because they're not wise. That being smart and being wise is quite different. Said very wisely, Sophodius. Yeah. So, going back to this position, right? At this point, my reading was, well... White's gonna get out, then I'm gonna get this peep, then I'm gonna play S1. And then white has a weak group, white has this, and black's just so thick. And I've already made my, black most of my territory in the corner. So I, I felt that this was amazing for me. And uh, if white jumps out, I still have this follow-up later, by the way, because this AB exchange just destroys white's position, right? Um, so, like, white, white's gonna pay something, so... White's shape is really bad in the corner, and that's the consequence of his invasion. Uh, once you've committed to a piece of territory, you can't trade it again. Yeah, exactly. And this is why, in my opinion, shape is by far the most important thing in Go. Because shape, shape transcends everything else. Um, like, shape doesn't change, usually. So, like, this... This... Oh, whoops. Uh, uh, eh? Okay. Like, this monster shape is going to stay a monster shape the rest of the game. You know? Um... I, I can't see how you would have made back all your territory in the corner when on the outside you could have had 20 points. Well, like, okay, let's consider this sequence, right? Um, first of all, it's Black's turn. It wasn't Black's turn earlier. Second of all, let's consider what the burden of territory is for Black if the outside did become my point. So let's say White had played this, right? 
Uh, how many points is black making? Well, approximately this many? It's not 20. It's much less than you think it is, you know? So in the game, white reduced less than 20 points probably. And his own corner, his own 10 point corner in the game is decimated. Uh, and I, I mean, white now has a weak group, right? Uh, and I, I let white know that. Actually, what happened in the game was I peeped at N2 and I realized, well, I default have this exchange and I, I default have these. I, I don't have to make these exchanges, but I have them. Which means that when I play uh, S8, white's corner is dying. So I just played, I just played S8 immediately. And here, I, I messed up my move order. Um, I should have played P2, and then the game's resignable for white, but uh, I was very sloppy. I, I pushed. And pushing gives white an opportunity to capture at Q2, which kind of solves his problems in the corner. Now, black's still much better because black has, black has a really strong shape and center towards the outside. But... Um, the game was resignable if I play, um, like, if at this point I play P2, because white's actually dying. Like, there's nothing white can do about it. White is going to die. So uh, it, it, it kind of goes like this and like this, and then white's, white's group is deceased. Um, and if white dares to fight, then this happens. And uh, as far as I can tell, uh, I was calculating this ko, and I decided that white doesn't want to play this ko. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so this goes here, here. Oh, wait, white can take... White technically has a way of taking first. So that's... That might be playable for white. Not sure if it's good, but it's playable. So maybe black has to be a little bit more precise than this, huh? Okay, fine, fine. Let's just connect and then attack the whole group. That's fine. So, okay, this is also playable for white, but a lot of the things that we discussed earlier are still true. White has a weak group. White's corner is 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 somewhat reduced because I got this move for free. And yeah, it, this this one's still co, but now this isn't heavy for black. So this isn't quite as heavy. Uh, like w the co is also risky for white, so I don't think white's going to start it uh, anytime soon. Um, so white has a lot of problems, and actually in the game I sort of let him solve them. Uh, nevertheless, I had a really strong position on the outside. This is still better for black. In the game I think I kicked. Yeah, in the game I kicked, because uh, I wanted to make white heavy, and this position is still quite favorable for black. And maybe like 30 moves later he died and resigned. So, oh well. Um, I, you know, actually... He really shouldn't die and resign, uh, but that's how it ended up going. Um, in any case, in my opinion, right, the moral of the story is that black technically had some type of area here, right? And white can invade it, or it's not clear if he can, but I, I let him, so okay, let's say he can invade. And by invading there's way too much you give up. So you create too many problems for an area that actually isn't that big if you just reduce it, which is why I'm a proponent of L5. So L5, such a sequence, I think I would take the points. White's got a solid shape, and Black's territory really isn't very big. You know, this is, this is quite a playable sequence for White. And I think that this is the respectful way to play for White if we consider how strong Black's shape in the center is. Because um, these two stones could become a problem for white in many variations. So this type of invasion that goes like like goes straight for the obvious territory, it very very quickly starts to make payments. So P six is a payment, letting me get uh, R two is a payment. Um, you know, in the game I could get P two instead. I chose S eight, and then it's. It's it, it's just white's position is is really hard to play from a practical perspective. I, I will mention I'm a bit surprised at the move order in the game. I'm wondering what happens if white plays o o uh, o five and now plays the co. And obviously during the game I thought that this was good for black uh, because otherwise I wouldn't have gone into it 
like I wouldn't have um, made this option available to white. Um, is it? I'm actually wondering, am I, am I good at reading and is it that now somehow... Hmm. So I'm somewhat surprised at the move order we chose. But uh, I think that I think the the point still stands that like F S eight is a move I'm not sure I agree with anymore because it sort of lets white get uh, R one potentially. So okay, let's play R two instead, and this position is really good for black because I'm threatening to kill in one move, and I'm also threatening to play O one, um, like in combo with the cuts. So it's white lives, I cut, white's in trouble. So yeah. Okay, so this was one example I thought was um, was pretty instructive, how white went for the cash and lost very quickly, or got himself into a bad position very quickly. Uh, the second example I wanted to check from my games is one where I actually got in trouble. Or not in trouble, but I did an invasion, and I was, you know, I was like all of you, all of, uh, you Taijin players, you know, and saying like, yes, I got my territory um look at me winning the game and then i reevaluated the position i was like oh i guess that wasn't good you know uh and my invasion was slightly unsound so um the game in question was played against uh lucas podpera who you guys may know of, um may know of uh, and uh i'm black and um i i'm playing for territory this game which is strange and white had some influence, and I fought inside white's influence because I liked living dangerously, I don't know. And somehow I survived. Uh, the, you know, the game's kind of even. And, okay, we did some fighting. Uh, this game, yeah, yeah. This game, uh, I ended up losing it by half a point, yeah. So this, this game's about five months old, and it was the Grand Prix Finale fifth place game. And... This is not go comment. I mean, Jeff hands that comment out pretty liberally. Um, I think he was. I think it was about this move, right? Uh, this move of Wukan's elicited a lot of distaste from from Jeff, and I understand why. Uh, but yeah, but then I think some of my moves weren't go either. So, um, and ten was a little bit random. Anyways, this game was fun to play. I actually enjoyed it because I was inside White's influence. Um, and, um, yeah, o 6 isn't a bad move, right? Lucan never plays moves that are, like, bad. He just plays moves that are... He very rarely plays the best move, but he very rarely plays a move that's bad. That's, that's how I see Lucan's go. Uh, so o 6 is that type of move, where I think a human will cringe because it's not accurate, but practically speaking, it's, like, not bad. That's my guess, anyway. Anyway, that's aside the point. Uh, we get to this position, and, uh, like, a little bit later. And I think the really important thing about this position right now is the top side. So everything else on the board is basically subtle. I'm really strong on the left side, I'm strong on the lower side, my group in the corner is alive, my group on the top right is, is obviously fine, and white's also pretty subtle, you know? And uh, the big question here is how does black deal with the top side? And... Now, in fairness to me, I'm living on 20 second increment at this point. I mean, it's it's quite late in the game, and I'm a relatively slow player. So, that you know, I was already under a degree of time pressure. Uh, but I devised an invasion scheme. I was like, eh, it looks invadable. Looks like the biggest area on the board, right? Uh, isn't M18 enough? We're going to talk about that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. So I opted, I opted to invade, and let, let's see how it went. Uh, I first I peeped and then I pushed and push is obviously a declaration of invasion because if I wanted to reduce I play m18 you know uh, but instead I went for the clamp and I uh, oh did I I didn't play here yet okay I, I played h17 and white technically can kill me locally but it's really risky for white because I have this cut and then white's corner is, is also in trouble. So it becomes a huge mess. Um, like maybe something like this. And um, yeah, that's why it goes difficult exactly. Is M18 enough? And I went for the invasion and my logic was, well, look at how strong my shape is on the outside. That's, you know, I don't think white's going to get that much from his, from 
his strength, you know, because obviously when you invade, this is the thing about invading, you get more points, but you make your opponent stronger. When you reduce, you get fewer points usually, but you get more strength on the outside. You're usually the one that's getting extra stones. And hence my, you know, the burden of territory, you know? And uh, in this position after I lived and uh, white got C14, um, I, you know, I stopped to think a second or well, as much as I could living on, on increment, you know, um, I'm still under time pressure, obviously. And I figured, well, okay, I have this group. That's, that's maybe five points for me. But I mean, look at this, right? That's, that's big profit for white in exchange. And all of this extra strength that, that white got, that's not very profitable. Right, which is why I went for this invasion, but it will have some kind of endgame benefits, which we will look at. So already A and B is basically sufficient compensation for my invasion. And then the question that was asked earlier in the chat by um, by uh, its Piro um, comes to you know comes to light. What if I just play M eighteen? You know, uh, like let's say I play M eighteen, and then White you know somehow tries to keep his points. And does a bad job of it because it's hard. I think it's probably this move now. And now I reduce this way, and now I peep here, you know? And then white has, yeah, later in the game, I'll peep here. So in the end, right, how much points does white, how many points does white actually have, you know? And the answer is not much. Not much. And uh, if I had to guess, if I had to guess the correct line of play is very possibly M18 Tanuki. <laughs> Um, or not M I would play M17 as white because other like otherwise this group's gonna get into some trouble. But uh, yeah, so this and then it might just be taking the corner, you know, because the the top side's already uh, smashed to bits. And this is something I didn't recognize during the game. Now I think that generally I'm quite good at understanding this type of dynamic, but. Um, I think under a little bit of time pressure, I, I reverted to the very primitive thinking that's, I think, very familiar to all of us. So, you know, when I looked at this area, my, uh, my perception was, I want to invade it, you know, can I invade it? And uh, it never crossed my mind until after the invasion was executed to ask whether I should invade it. And uh, as a matter of fact, this invasion is very possibly why I lost, because I think I was better beforehand and now the game's like even i think so i was slightly better and then then the game was even i think this is also the ai evaluation uh now to be fair to me this lost like two points it wasn't it wasn't terrible you know it shall shall from now on be called the taijin brain um yeah i guess so you could call it the taijin brain um it is possible is it possible that lucan mind controls people to misjudge territory uh, I want to relieve you of the burden of territory. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is something Lucan is extremely good at. Um, uh, so actually, um, something very uh, interesting is, at least to me interesting, is that recently I've been checking out a certain professional player called um, Akagawa Shukaku. He's a player that was really strong, I think, in the, you know, 50s and 60s. Uh, he won the Honimbo title, like, you know, like eight times or something like that in a row. Um, and uh, he was a very strong player. And I was looking at his games, and he reminded me a lot of Lucan's style of play. Uh, and, you know, that that's not something I often say about professionals. Um, you lost only two points while you lost the game by half a point. Well, yeah. I mean, the point is that I considered that I was slightly better before this, and after this, I was slightly worse. Um, so it's obviously not like the losing move or something, but I do think it was important. And it made the game hard to play from my perspective from now on. Um, but yeah, it's it's not a huge mistake. It's just a mistake. Lucan possesses the ghost of whatever his name was. Well, um, what I think is very similar about these two players is, um, and, and this is, I really wanted to make a lecture topic, but I didn't like look at enough of Takakawa's games. Uh, is what I call invisible points. So in a position, both sides usually have 
some area which they sort of control, but is not like clearly delineated. And those those are invisible points. So maybe I'll give an example. Like let's say actually right here. Right here in this position, right? White's strong position like f16, d15, h16, j15, does have invisible points because that's a strong shape and then eventually, you know, not necessarily soon, what all of this white strong shape um is um going to for example play this instant and, and play here and then suddenly you have like three extra points you know and there's usually not many invisible points so most people go like so what you know it's like three four points and the thing is three four points often win a game you know and uh i've had especially when i was a slightly less experienced player i had some games where i thought i was winning and because i didn't respect invisible points that uh, influence has and then you know eventually my opponents just made some extra points and then i lost you know i had a game against cornell burzo i like talking about this game where i thought i was ahead by komi at the beginning of the end game and i was behind um and i was behind by komi um by the end of the game uh, and one of the reasons was that my endgame wasn't very good. The other was that he had some influence I didn't respect. Takagawa is famous for the motto, Flowing water doesn't compete to be first. His play seems unhurried. Yeah, he's a very solid player, I would say. Relatively, like, unambitious, let's say. So his play style is not my favorite. I, I'm i I'm very much more... Um, I'd very much prefer to uh, learn from the likes of, uh, like, Fujisawa Hideyuki, for example. But, you know... I found something valuable in Takagawa's goal that I'm not very good at yet, which is understanding invisible points in the end game. Like I found this uncannily impressive. So very possibly one of my next lectures will be that, you know? Um, and this relates to our lecture topic because when I invade, that switches the ownership of the invisible points. So let's say I decided to, you know, reduce. Let's say that, you know, I um, peep here and then I play like this and then I reduce this way. Black has many more invisible points in the center now because I have control, right? Like all of these stones are there that weren't before. And, and the effect of these stones isn't that high, but Go is decided by small margins, right? So this game was a half point game. And if we consider that the top side of whites, if I reduce appropriately, it has like 15 points or something like that, then reducing it fully to give up to give up this shape and to give white a better shape on on the outside that's probably not worth it you know and that's you know especially in Bioyomi, that was hard for me to visualize so i made a mistake right um invading switches the ownership of the invisible points is a great way of looking at it i guess so that i guess it's a nice way of looking at it so there there's that's one way i like to think about it and the other way that i i like personally is to consider the burden of territory, right? So I consider that when you say you own something in Go, you have to keep justifying it. And that's, un you know, that's really unfortunate. You know, for example, when Black says he owns the top side, then White's going to get M19, and White's going to get D15, and, and White's going to get this move. And, you know, conversely, if White owns the top side, then Black's the one who's going to get these moves in Sente. And if he wants this move, or if he wants this move in Sente, and then he's the one that's going to get to play here. So, um, and and this is, you know, a very important thing about trade-offs uh, that uh, I think is underestimated in Go. Very rarely is something as bad for one side or the other as, as people think it is. You know? um, usually there's some kind of benefit or trade-off to what you're doing. And that makes games that always makes positions more nuanced than, than most people would give them credit for. And, uh, I, I, you know, the reason I decided to talk it, about trade-offs a little bit more in the context of invasions is that people tend to look at invasions in a very linear fashion. Like, they look at it like, does one side kill or does the other side live? Very, very often, you know? Uh, and this happens at a very high level. And that's not how invasions work. Some invasions work like that. And I think if if an invasion is you live, you win, you die, you lose. 
then somebody has already messed up, you know? So, um, yeah, in my opinion, usually some side has really messed up badly if, if you need to kill or, or to live, you know? Uh, Kadago's prediction of final ownership can visualize this, I believe. When you invade, your surrounding area's ownership is reduced. Okay, that's interesting. Is that a Katrain uh, feature? Katrain's a program uh, by, like, there's an NGD, uh, you know, one of our NGD students actually developed Katrain. Uh, and that sounds like something out of um, Katrain. Like, that sounds like a Katrain feature, which it might not be, I don't know. Um, it's native in the neural net, really? Wow. I didn't know about that. That's crazy. I, I've never seen that before. Also, AI Sensei. Okay. That's fascinating. I didn't know about that. Very interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Marcel's really providing some really good ways to look at this also, or at least, you know, concluding them. So I I like this concept of, of keeping in, in mind invisible points. And to a large extent, this deals with who has control, right, of the exterior areas of the board. Um, yeah, so this particular game, my invasion wasn't optimal, right, um, as we discussed. And I was slightly behind after this. Uh, I actually gained slightly in the end game. Uh, and we had a crazy co, and then um, I was I, after the co, I was behind, I would say, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And then, you know, eventually I caught up a little bit in the late end game and lost by half a point anyway. Um, so that was that was my game with Lucan. And uh, yeah, I'll try next time. And yeah, I'll I'll move on to a next example. Which one? Because I've there's limited time, but there's multiple examples, so I have to choose here. Hmm. Oh, okay, yeah, I know what I'll talk about now. Um, for every point of the board, it gives an expectation of who will win this point at the end of the game. Okay, yeah, that's really good. That's actually very similar. So in my, my lesson against my private student, uh, against, with my private student, where we discussed this position, I, ma I made him a very similar question. Like, what do you expect about the ownership of points on the right side of the board? So that, yeah, that, that sort of reminds me of that discussion. Uh, and not just 0, 1, but in between. Oh, so it gives like a percentage chance of how likely the point is to end up in one camp. Yeah, that's fascinating. I didn't know that existed. Oh, man, I'm such a noob. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Katrin with invisible points before I invented them. I didn't invent them. Probably invented the word invisible points, but may maybe not even that, so I don't know. Um, the concept is definitely not new. Um, Okay, so the the next game is actually a teaching game I played with Auntie. And uh, remember how I talked about how this type of like crazy Taijin player invasion is playable, uh, but very circumstantial? Well, we're going to see it happening. So that's, yeah. This is my game with Auntie. I'm black. We're playing on no Komi because, um, uh, you know. Um, that way I have a remote chance of winning, uh, and, and Auntie usually does quite well against me. Um, and, uh, so, I don't know, the game, this was actually one of my better games. I, I did relatively well, uh, I stabilized in the center, like, I didn't get myself killed or anything. Uh, in Chinese it's called Dark Points. Okay, that's, okay, close, close to my terminology, I suppose. Um. Like dark matter. Um, so, okay. We get to this position, right? And we're going to talk about this lower side, right? So, um, at this point, Auntie counted and he figured that without Komi, it's sort of difficult to win this game. Uh, so, he invaded. Uh, like, he went for this invasion, and we've talked about how these invasions have many trade-offs, right? Um, how you give control of the invisible points, you give control of the end game uh, on the fringes of the board. So there's a lot of like negative aspects to this invasion, but nevertheless, he considered it's worth it. And actually, this is one of the situations where I think it's not unreasonable. And one of the one of the reasons is that white is super thick in the center. Not super, but you know, white's white's pretty strong in the center, and 
this enables him to invade without sacrificing his position that badly on the outside. Like, this, this influence indirectly funds such an invasion. Uh, so, okay. Um, and, and here, uh, I asked Antia a question uh, very soon. Like, I think here... Wait, which timing did I do it? I didn't know, no? Okay, here. Um, I played R2. And R2 is a mean move. Um, I'm sort of proud of this move. And it's... It's asking White a question. So, if you keep your point, right? Then... I might try and murder you because I, I got I got P2 extra, right? And that's what I did. I tried to murder him. Uh that didn't go as well as planned, but it could have. We, you know, we we were we were analyzing and my chances of killing weren't bad. We were in Bioyomi here. So this this was a good attempt from Black. Um But the idea is like the discussion is well if White gives up the points, right? Uh, by by just pulling back and then like living with his group, right? Then White has made a significant payment, right? This invasion of White has we've already seen the drawback. We've already seen what White gives up, and that's that's the important thing. Like that's the discussion that we're having here. So when White invades, White says, "I want this money," and what I'm saying is, "How much are you giving up for it?" Right? And then Auntie said, nothing at all. I'm not giving you a cent. And I'm like, well, okay, I might have to kill you then. That's the discussion. Um, R2 can only be countered by D2. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I'd play C3. But, you know, I can't. Anyway, terrible joke. Um, yeah, so this particular game, I went, you know, I went insane and I tried to kill. And I... You know, we were we were analyzing and we thought there's some chances that I can kill here, but it's really hairy. That's it's um Um I think like I think we analyzed that maybe J6 is sort of challenging. But yeah. Then like when White plays H6 and cross cuts it's a mess, right? And this was a Bioyomi game, so then Things are getting really heated, you know? Um, this was really unclear. So white chose to keep the corner point and live on the bottom. Exactly. So when white played on the lower side, I sort of expected that that means that white's willing to give something up. You know, I thought that that, that means that white's willing to trade. And anti, maybe because we're playing a no komi game, right? So he has a little bit of a disadvantage. It was like, no, I want, I want all of it, you know? And uh, in the game, he actually got away with it. Um, but this is, you know, recognize that this is extremely dangerous for white. Um, that now white is locally dead, and, and we get to this type of position where it's really unclear whether white's going to make it out alive or not. I will mention that one of the reasons that white can do this is the influence. So I think many people would find it hard to find a purpose for this influence. And in the game, Anti was able to, like, had an intuition, let's say, that this influence would indirectly allow him to fight. In the game, I played at h6, which is probably an inaccuracy, and um, he got out relatively easily. Yeah, here he just got out. Yeah. Now he's alive, and I, I invested two moves here. It is a Bioyomi game, so unfortunate. Now, let's go back. We weren't sure what happens after Black plays, um, after Black plays the Kema. So this one, this one was the more challenging option because if White just uh, plays normally, like doing nothing in particular, just pushing mindlessly, then we figured this is a mess. Um, <laughs> because Black's dying, White's dying. Um, wait, I should play here. So this is a really interesting position, and this arises from the discussion. Like the this whole discussion is happening because. White did something he shouldn't be allowed to do, in my opinion. And uh, I wasn't able to punish it. So this is just um, a very interesting discussion between me and Anti that sort of reminded me of, of the lecture topic. Um, interestingly here, even though the, the topic is invasions and their trade-offs, White refused to accept the trade-off and somehow still 
you know, lived easily. Well, not easily, but lived. Um, so I guess that's that's the issue when an amateur plays a professional. But, you know. um, uh, so yeah, this was this was one funny example that that came to mind. Um, and I think, by the way, since we're discussing, you know, earlier I played this game with Asu, right? No, not not this one. Um, this game with Asu, right? Uh, when I think when um when Anti played this move, he said, "Oh, I'm going full Asu." So actually, Asu has a little bit of a reputation for this type of invasion. Um, that's a little bit cramped. So um. And you know that's not necessarily a bad thing. It depends on which invasions you make, how, and how you make them. So, uh, yeah. So I did have one other example, but we've already gone seventy-five minutes. So I'm not sure if I'll do it. Um, I guess I'll just wrap it up. I suppose. Um, but let let's conclude. Let's say, and also feel free to ask questions, or you know, if you want to revisit any moment in lecture, we can do that. Um. What I want to talk about roughly is that uh, strong stones have an inherent value. So, you know, it's it's a very prevalent mindset, especially when you're actually playing the game, you know, when you're in the competitive um, environment, it's really easy to focus on the tangibility of stuff. So when you look at influence, you're like, is it making points? Can my opponent live in this area? And Go is actually much more nuanced than that and much more beautiful than that. It's not just do you keep the points or not. It There's so much nuance to it that, it, that it's insane, you know? And um, that's probably one of the things that um, I, want, I, I want viewers to take away from this lecture, which is that usually there's... Like, whenever you, you think of a position in a polarized way, like my student did. So um, my student, we discussed this game at the beginning of the lecture, and he was like, here I'm ahead by 20 points. And and then I, I threw the game, you know, that was his mindset. And he's not a weak player at all, right? He's, I think, 2Q level or so. Um, you know, not dissimilar level to, I guess, a lot of the audience. And that sort of polarized view of the game, which I all, of, often had, um, probably until I was around 6 stun level, uh, is not really accurate, usually. The game is much more nuanced than that, you know? And uh, sometimes I feel like, this is one of the things that AI taught me, sometimes I feel like one position was really bad for me, or one position was really good for me, and like there were these big shifts in, in how the game was going. Very often you check the AI and, and the different, like, the, um, the opinion of the AI isn't nearly as polarized. Um, and that that's one of the things that helped me realize that, you know, there's always benefits and drawbacks, right? And uh, we don't consider them fairly. Uh, relating specifically to influence, um, like the point I want to make is that when your shapes are strong, not even when you have influence, but just when your shapes are strong, there's inherent value in that. And uh, it's basically unheard of that strong stones aren't valuable, basically, you know, um, even if their value isn't obvious, or the area where you were building gets invaded, that doesn't mean they're not valuable. Uh, and that's something very hard to visualize while you play the game, but I would suggest you try, uh, because that uh, I think that, let's say, more nuanced approach to the game of Go is, is actually more accurate um, and a lot more fun. So, um, yeah. Um, but I suppose that's kind of... Um, kind of it for for uh, today's lecture if, if there's no no, um, no questions that people want to ask or anything that uh um you want to you want to comment on uh i'll probably end it here um i should check is there is there someone to raid or not let's see mm -hmm. I guess there's Ternamia, why not? Um we can we can send people to Ternamia, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh thanks for watching, um Bad Kai. No questions, just wanna say it was a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks, Sophodius. I appreciate that. Great lecture, thank you very much. Yeah, um 
I, I appreciate the kind words. So um, let's uh, read. Actually, how do you read? Is it like slash? I'm confused. Oh, yeah, yeah, raid. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the lecture. I only got here at the end, so I have to watch it from the recording. Yeah, uh, this will be posted on uh, on YouTube um, by the NGD. So, um, yeah. Wait, it's getting kind of hard for me to raid, so I guess I won't. Um, oh, like I can't. I've forgotten how to, and I don't have access to, to the account. But yeah, uh, Ternamia's on. Uh, he's streaming Go. If you want to watch something, watch him. Um, raid, yeah, raid user. How do I type Korean characters? Um, wait, um, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, yeah, I guess I'll, 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 I'll sign off. You can first, yeah, yeah, I mean, wait, does Ternamia, right? Does Ternamia work? Oh, actually. Uh, oh, thank you, baby shamble. Uh, one of the issues is that my computer is remarkably slow when I'm streaming. Like it, it lags out completely. Uh. Did that work? Let's hope that worked. Um. Why didn't that work? Oh man, I'm I'm I am a, I am a boomer. Maybe now it's raiding, I hope so. Yeah, thanks for the... Yeah, okay, I managed to get a raid working. Um, wow, I'm... I mean, really, one of the issues is that my computer is unbelievably slow. So, it, it, like, I have to wait 10 seconds before stuff I, I, I type actually shows up. Um, I should get a better computer. Anyway, thank you, thank you everyone for watching the lecture. And uh, that, was, that was fun, especially the end or something. Um, yeah. I'll see you guys. Thank you very much for watching.